Senate President Craig Blair will join us to close down the show today. And I understand, uh, Mr. Gilstrap, that he had quite the interaction with Baby Dog recently. <laughs> I read the newspaper this morning <laughs> that he, he was giving a speech at a, at, a, at a banquet, and the governor came in apparently after he did, and Baby Dog hopped up on the chair and ate what was left on, <laughs> on Greg Blair's plate, which is just kind of a neat image. <laughs> Chuck, that ever happened to you? <laughs> No, I don't. Not that that I can recall. Although I I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in the past uh, uh, a pet of mine didn't uh, uh, finish a plate off for me before. Uh huh. I'm just curious what the pecking order is. You got the governor, you got baby dog, and you got the Senate president. So, (laughs) baby dog's eating the Senate president's food. That tells me baby dog's number two, (laughs) and not the lieutenant governor, Craig Blair. Well, I don't think it was any secret that the two weren't getting along too well together <laughs> instead of present there for a while. So you're thinking that was on direct order of the governor is what you're saying then, Chuck? Um, I'm not saying anything. It's just, <laughs> and, it, and, it's, never know. and it's clear that baby dog doesn't get enough to eat otherwise. <laughs> so. that's, just, that's just dogs. Have you ever seen a dog turn down food? Ever? <laughs> It doesn't matter if how hungry they are or aren't. They just eat. Uh, Delegate Chuck Hurst is our guest here on the program. Chuck, you are not in Charleston, correct? Correct. I, I, I am not. I, I had other plans scheduled before I knew about what we were going to have interim meetings uh, in April. Um, and, and luckily, I, only one of my committees would be, ha- would be meeting this, this time around anyway. So I simply missed one meeting. But I would have liked to have been able to have been there yesterday for the uh, jails and prisons uh, to, to, yes. to have a little more sense of what's going on there because I, I actually expect that we'll probably be addressing the corrections officers uh, sometime during one of our interim, interim meetings where we'll probably have a session is my guess. During the course of the article in the newspaper, the journal, uh, Senator Blair was quoted as requesting that uh, we start to look into bringing the death penalty back for drug dealers, uh, pushers, as he, I think the article said, is pushing this crap on our kids. Uh, fentanyl, of course, is an issue in this country, and uh, a terrible one at that. Would you consider bringing the death penalty back, Chuck, if it, if it came down to the House of Delegates voting on legislation? How would you look at that? Well, I, 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 I don't know if I could get there to support that or not, to be quite honest with you. Um, and in, in large part because uh, uh, our judicial system gets it wrong too many times. And to take somebody's life, I mean, if you just take one life, I mean, that's, that, that is unbelievably tragic if you take one life that, where the judicial system got it wrong. That's an interesting take on that. Uh, you and Bill share a, uh, a thought process on that, I believe, Mr. Stubblefield. Yes, we do, and I agree with Chuck 100% on that. We've, we've made – there evidently has been several mistakes made in the past, and obviously DNA helps a lot, but I don't think we're to the stage now that we can be 100% sure that someone is – is guilty. I guess it could be exten- extenuating circumstances, but in general, I agree with uh, Delegate Horse. I think there's an issue yeah. with proportion. You know, I think it's Eighth Amendment that guarantees against cruel and unusual punishment. But if that, if the distribu- distribution of the drugs kills a bunch of kids at a school, that's murder, and I, I don't have a problem with that. Chuck. Well, um, and and I used to always thought think that I supported the death penalty, you know, in, in years past, mm-hmm. you know, a good while back. Uh, I, I always thought it was probably a just punishment until, um, you know, I got more involved in politics and, and seeing what happens in the court systems and how many, and simply how many times the judicial system gets it wrong. And, um, uh, and, and, and there's other issues with the judicial system, even sometimes with law enforcement. Um, there's there's been times where law enforcement has actually actually lied knowingly lied to get to get convictions and uh, um, that that's just frightening to think about going down that road. Uh, yeah. Now, it could could something be drafted to maybe get my support? Uh, it, I, I would have to feel comfortable that there would never be an accident to, to get there. 
Chuck, I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm surprised you're taking this position. Actually, I'm quite encouraged you're taking this position. But does that mean that if it was introduced in the House of Delegates, uh, there uh, the it'd be problematic whether it could pass or not? Do a lot of your colleagues feel the same way you do? Or do you know? I I really don't know. I know there are some others. I just don't know. I just don't know. Have a sense of what percentage would. Would, would feel that way. So the, the other way of saying, you do not think it'd be a slam dunk it would pass if it was in, introduced? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it'd be a slam dunk. I really, I really yeah. wouldn't. I mean, uh, Chuck, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just looking, searching for words. I wasn't yeah. sure what I wanted to say there. If I recall, Delegate John Overington was your delegate, correct? Yes. And John for most of his political career, introduced the death penalty, capital punishment legislation, while the Democrats were in charge. And, of course, that was never going to go anywhere. Once the Republicans were in charge, John stopped introducing it. And my impression was from him that leadership didn't want to go that way. Has anybody made an attempt in either of the two legislative sessions you've been a part of, Chuck, as, a, as an elected delegate, to introduce a capital punishment bill? Um, I've heard talk every once in a while, but I don't know. I don't recall anybody actually uh, taking any action. Um, I mean, you know, you, you, you always hear somebody bring it up occasionally, but but I'm not, I, I cannot recall any any uh, action or any bill that was drafted or any anything anything to where it moved to where it was looking like maybe it was going to be a serious issue that somebody was going to act on it. Interesting. Uh, let's talk about prisons, as Senator Blair made his comments from Moundsville, and the issues that we have with prisons right now, National Guard staffing those prisons in uh, ancillary roles, as I understand it, uh, because they are not trained uh, corrections facility officers. What do we need to do, Chuck, to attract people to that profession? We need to obviously increase the, the wage, but it's also a job that many people, for the most part, right now would not prefer to have um yes um wait wages is certainly a a big part of what needs to be done um and and, uh, and if we could get fully staffed that would probably help some of the other problems as well uh, uh more specifically be by you know being overworked having to having to do double shifts or you know overtime all the time um, that would probably help considerably as well, um, and but but I'm not sure that that's really going to take care of all of it either. It's still it still may be a struggle, uh, as I understand it's a struggle in Virginia and, and Maryland as well, and and they actually pay considerably more. John Gilstrap, so, uh, I'm not quite sure what all it's going to take. Uh, do we have the prison shortages in the parts of the state? And I'm not sure where our prisons are in the state. But in the areas that are la less affluent, where the current pay rate is buys more of a, a, a more livable lifestyle, I suppose, do we still have the shortages there? Uh, my understanding is statewide, uh, whether it's whether it's the rural areas or whether it's the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, my understanding, we have the shortages statewide. Because according to the paper this morning, it's over a thousand open positions. For, uh, for the prison yes, system, I, yeah, I, I don't doubt that any at all. I went on that that tour there at Eastern Regional Jail with the other delegates there a few weeks ago, and um, I think you're only staffed. I'm not 100 percent sure, but uh, I think 60 percent is what they're staffed at right now. So they're like 40 percent down or something like that. I mean, it's, it numbers were pretty big. Yeah, I, I remember earlier, Chuck, that it's. I think I remember that uh, uh, with the National Guard, uh, there were still something like 450, 500 vacancies left, and that's with the National Guard playing a role as, as it is. So. With yeah, numbers like well. that, it almost makes you wonder if there's something more systemic. I mean, that's not that's not just a, a pay thing that's that's working conditions yeah, and, it's i, I don't and, know what and, it is but a thousand wow and and, and, and i don't dis i don't disagree with that i mean I, I knew a guy that worked in the prisons over in maryland as a guard for a number of years and some of the things he told me i mean I, I, it it just wouldn't be a good work environment and, and and i don't mean that necessarily by 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 uh uh the corrections but by uh 
guarding inmates just by actions of a lot of the inmates and derogatory stuff and uh, I, I, I could say it but it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be very good to say some of the things on the air <laughs> you can say them <laughs> once Chuck <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'd be the last time you had me on <laughs> as I said you're gonna say them once <laughs> good Bill yeah no I was uh, uh, thinking what John Gilstrap said there has to be some sense uh, uh, systemic <laughs> systemic <laughs> thank you thank you John I need help uh, problem because but this has been around for quite a while but as I I think that the differential between what the correction officers have been paid and some of the uh, our the deputies is fairly significant so it's uh, uh, so and we think the deputies are underpaid. So if you move that ratchet that, that down a step, the correction officers are significantly underpaid. So do you have any idea at all, John? The ten thousand dollars was mentioned uh, at one time, but I don't know if that was a pay increase or a bonus. Uh, do you have any sense at all how much money we're talking about for increasing the correction officer's salary? Um, I do not really know a number to put on that. Uh, but I would say it's probably going to have to be something fairly substantial. Mm -hmm. um, 10000 or more, Chuck? Well, I mean, 10000 sounds like probably something where you're getting in the ballpark of what might be needed uh, uh, to, to retain these people, uh, yeah. especially here in Eastern Panhandle, because as, as everybody knows, uh, most everybody in this area is well aware of, is we're not competing with the rural areas of West Virginia. We're competing with... Uh, uh, Maryland and uh, Virginia primarily with very uh, affluent areas uh, that, that pay considerably more than what uh, than what the state of West Virginia can pay at the moment. Yeah, Matt Harvey just put uh, on a, a chat uh, board, uh, of course Matt is prosecuting attorney of Jefferson County, says Eastern uh, Regional Jail has a 70% vacancy rate for guards. 70%. 70. So that means 30% yeah. is filled. Mm. Yep. I, I, I knew it was pretty high. Um, and, and like I say, you you know you you you, you get there and you hear all these numbers and stuff all the time. It's, it's kind of keep, hard to keep them straight a little bit, but I knew I knew they were understaffed by quite a bit. Chuck Hurst is our guest here on the program from the 95th. He chairs the Natural Resources Committee, Energy and Manufacturing, Finance, Jails and Prisons, and Workforce Development. Also, committees of which he is a part. John, go ahead. Do we have a feel for what percentage of the prison population is a part of the prison population because of drugs? one way or the other i'm going to guess it's very high uh i think we talked about that on the tour and and, and yes it's very high i don't remember what the numbers were but uh but yeah uh Ill illegal drugs is uh is is very high uh, i'm not sure if it's straight up the drugs or even, even those that aren't necessarily in there for the drugs probably drugs is what led them to commit many of the crimes that, that end up putting them there uh, if, if that makes sense to you, I don't know if I said that very clearly. Well, drugs are an economy unto themselves, right? So you you got to have the suppliers, you got to have all the ancillary uh, people and operations that go into the drug issue. So, yes, uh, yes, and, and 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 quite often we see burglaries taking place and uh, perhaps even armed robberies at time uh, where where somebody just uh, trying to get money for to maintain their habit. Quite often. And, and and that's what that's kind of what I was speaking to. That maybe they don't necessarily get caught for the drugs, but they get caught because of committing a burglary, or or maybe even something worse that uh, lands them in jail. Although the actual cause was their, their their drug issues that that got you know that took them down that path. Chuck, what committee meeting are you missing in Charleston this week? You mentioned there was one that you would be meeting. I'm I'm missing uh, fi finance, finance, joint standing committee on finance. How is there not an option for you to join that meeting remotely? Um, or, or is there? Is, is there an option at all that exists if you're not in the House to be able to see the meeting? No, I, I, I mean, the, the, they're, they're all, they should all be live recorded. Not live recorded, but, live but they should all be telecast live to where, to where you can tune in and, and listen in. Um, uh, and I don't think I don't think we have any of them that are actually uh, uh, video, but but uh, you have the the live audio anyhow. 
Your, your question, I think, was something like Zoom mm-hmm. or Teams. Uh, with one or two people being absent, uh, I think it probably would work. If you had several people absent, then then it becomes very disruptive. I all of us have been on Zoom committee meetings or Zoom meetings where more than one person is trying to participate remotely, and it gets confusing very, very quickly. And I suspect if you're given the option uh, that you stay at home and participate by Zoom, a lot of folks would say, okay, I'll stay at home and participate participate by Zoom, and the, the end result would be several people trying to participate remotely, and that wouldn't, I don't think that would work well. Well, but I don't know that that's a good reason to not be able to include someone who can't attend. It just seems to me that that's operating out of fear instead of being proactive and allowing for the latest in technology to ensure maximum participation of these folks. Okay, pushing back a little bit on that, Rob. If somebody was ill, and I could see why, if someone had a scheduling conflict, that would kind of be skating on the edge. Why Why should we make provisions for you and not somebody else? Yeah, and, 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 the, and the one thing I'm not sure about, so I, so I don't want to say for certain, but I know as far as session goes, it's constitutionally required to be there, uh, uh, you know, for, for voting and what have you. I'm not sure if that applies to committee meetings as well. Um, well, and, and, and cl- it, it likely yeah. does, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, you wouldn't be voting in this particular case, I'm guessing, as much as observing, right? Well, in, in our meetings, no, you wouldn't necessarily be voting, but uh, normal normal committee meetings, yes, you, 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 you would uh, quite often be voting in uh, regular committee meetings. Right, but that would only be during the 60-day session or a special session where you're called in for a specific Cor- yeah, item. Yeah, 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 correct, correct. Yeah, so it seems like in an interim you should be able to at least participate remotely. Uh, that's my thought, at least anyway. Um, the HOA that I belong to, all of our meetings are, are available to anybody to, to tune in remotely, zoom in. No, I think we use teams or something like teams, that yeah mm-hmm. uh, but I, I don't understand why they don't have that in the West, West Virginia legislature in regards to the finance committee Chuck are they considering anything in specific did you get the agenda um, the agenda didn't go into specifics of what they was uh, considering uh, um, there was uh, some presentations I guess being uh, some presenters were going to be there uh, 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 the uh, finance guy Hardy, he was going to be there, if I recall correctly, um, and, and exactly what they're t- we were talking about, we're going to be talking about or discussing. I don't recall right now. I'm not sure if it was actually listed on the agenda what the subject actually was. Are the committee meeting, the interim committee meetings, held by like regular order with Robert's rules and, and that sort of thing, or is it a bunch of folks around a conference table? Uh, it's pretty much regular rules. Uh, and and but but quite often, quite often, uh, inner meetings you know, is, is somebody presenting information to you. Quite often, so you know, like uh, uh, you may have somebody from the governor's office or you know a, a head of an agency uh, discussing a particular. Usually, usually it'll be something that's uh, a particular issue where we'll possibly be dealing with uh, legislation next session, uh, dealing with that issue. So, so before we even get into session, we get a, a sense of what all is going on and uh, uh, what gives us something to work with before we actually get to session. And quite often the bill will be drafted before session starts, and uh, we're, all, we're all ready to go with it at that point once, once uh, session comes in. So you'll be getting on an issue, whatever the issue might be, there'll be expert testimony that is then on the record for that particular yeah, issue? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes. Generally, that's what it's going to be about. And and here's a, here's a good one. This this happened the other year in Natural Resources. Uh, kind of explain it to you. Uh, the the uh, interim committee had uh, some presenters there about uh, uh, hunting hunting uh, big game with air rifles, and they presented. They they had air rifles there to show us. They had the projectiles there. Went in depth as to how they work, how 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 far they were. Uh, functional at um, and, and and all that type of stuff and, and what states uh, in the what other states actually allow them to be used and kind of talked about what the other states laws were and what have you and and, and and that's what they were there presenting it because they they were they were wanting to get legislation uh, adopted in West Virginia to allow hunting uh, big game hunting with air rifles and 
I, I got a bill drafted after that uh, but for when session came, and we ran that bill, and, of course, uh, it passed and everything. It, it is now law. It was law, I guess, uh, session before last. Chuck, do you ever have a quorum issue in, with the committees? Uh, I've seen before where it's pretty close to not having a quorum. And, of course, without a quorum, uh, but you don't vote during interims, but during regular session you would be voting. Uh, the, uh, many of you are on several committees. Uh, is it? I assume it's well within the realm of possibility that there be a conflict between the various committees and a certain committee would not have a quorum, therefore they cannot take a vote. I assume that that's possible. Well, it, it, it's possible, yes. Um, in in um and, and, and I guess what would happen then is, is if, a, if a committee doesn't quite have a quorum, uh, they'll, they'll put out a shout out to some of the delegates that aren't there and ask if somebody can get there so that they can, uh, so that they can meet their quorum so that they, they can uh, uh, ha- go, go on with the meeting. Uh, and, and I think usually that they're able to get somebody to show up to, usually if they're lacking a quorum, it's just one or two members. Uh, they're usually able to get somebody there to uh, uh, make the quorum at that point. For this interim, interim committee, uh, they'll be coming, is it just for a few days or going to be for a week, or do you have any idea how long it'll be? Uh, inter- interim committee meetings are usually three days. Usually they're Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Uh, and uh, my previous experience Usually I only had usually I had two days where I actually had committee meetings and the other day I didn't actually have a committee meeting. Uh, although nothing precludes you precludes anybody from going in and setting in on a uh, committee meeting if you have interest in that subject. Chuck, the bills that you sponsored during the session that were in committee at the end of session that didn't go anywhere, do those just die at the end of the session or do they enter into like a queue for the next time you folks get together to commit or to consider bills okay well they they actually die at at, at some point before the end of session if they're just sitting in a committee if they haven't made it out of committee there's a there's a date certain that they're considered dead um now after session and before next session starts at some point uh we'll, we'll get a letter from drafting wanting to know if we want to uh, uh, resubmit those bills in the the next session, if we want to draft it again for the next session. And you can go down through and check which ones that you want to resubmit and send send that back to drafting, and and they'll be ready to go on uh, on day one. That's that's one of the reasons why on day one you may have five, six, seven hundred bills introduced on on day one, because it's, it's those bills that carried over or that the delegates wanted to carry over into the next session. And I think we saw that with the Senate this year at the first day with so many bills introduced. Do you see West Virginia going down the path that some other states are doing or considering already in regards to allowing uh, 12-year-olds and up uh, to be uh, carrying concealed weapons and such? Um, What, what, 12-year-olds? It was was Missouri. It was Missouri, Missouri, I believe it was, right? Whoa, I missed something here. Carrying a gun? Yeah, well, by by your reaction, it sounds like that's not something that you would approve of. <laughs> Which I'm I'm happy to hear, by the way. I, I'm very pro gun. Don't get me wrong, but I I just can't imagine twelve year olds carrying guns. Um, <laughs> yes, that's, that sounds really unreasonable, actually. <laughs> not, not only can you imagine it, Missouri, you can do it in in Missouri. So I do, I got I got to look that up. I find that almost hard to believe. If you you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> and yet. It's true. Everybody knows you got to be at least 13. <laughs> uh, Chuck, uh, good to talk with you, man. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, I'll just, uh, I, I guess I'll just be looking forward to when the next session gets started, I guess, so we can get some stuff done and, and I can uh, try, try to get, get my bill uh, uh, through, through next session. It, uh, I got it out of committee this past session, but they pulled it rules committee, and I'm not quite sure exactly why. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be finding that out, and hopefully get the bill reworked. And uh, which which one are you talking about, Chuck? That was the uh, warrantless search. Bill warrantless search, yes. Okay, mm-hmm. very good. All right. Hey, so thanks, we, man. We had, okay, thank you. Have a good day.